people are, are awakening to the reality that what mediates or what determines performance is their mentality. Hello, and welcome to the first episode, the very first episode of 80% Mental, a brand new podcast all about the psychology of sport. My name is Dr. Pete Olushaga. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology and a chartered psychologist with around 15 years experience of working in sport. Most weeks, I'm going to be joined by Hugh Gilmore, another psychologist with a wealth of experience supporting athletes and coaches in elite level sport. And in this podcast series, we're going to explore how important the mind is in the world of sport. Okay, so technically speaking, this isn't actually the first episode. We did record a short introduction, which we called episode zero, where I just talk a little bit more about who we are and what you can expect from the show. Basically, though, each week we'll start by asking a question about the psychology of sport. A question you've always wanted to know the answer to, like, is there such a thing as a winning mindset? What's the best way to set goals that really stick? And what's the deal with mindfulness? We'll then look at what the evidence really says, get the thoughts of some of the top minds in the field, and see if we can find out what the answer or the answers might be to some of those questions, and what we can learn from those answers. So whether you're an athlete, or a coach, a psychologist, or even just a sports fan, hopefully you'll be able to learn something each week. As I say, I'm joined by Hugh Gilmore. Hugh, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Pete. I'm uh, excited to be talking to Dr. Jonathan Fader, who's got a world and wealth of experience all the way from across the pond. And it is my genuine pleasure to welcome as our first guest on our first show, Dr. Jonathan Fader, clinical and performance psychologist, probably best known for his work with professional athletes in Major League Baseball and the NFL, spending time with both the New York Mets and the New York Giants. Dr. Fader, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great, Pete. I'm so psyched to be here. I feel I'm honored, man. I'm on the first podcast. I got to represent hard. <laughs> first podcast of the first series. Yeah, man, this is exciting. It's well, what was really exciting about it too, man, is there's just, I think there's, there's not enough out there in the podcast world that like clearly talks about, about sport and performance psychology. So it's so great what you guys are doing here. And I think it's going to help a lot of coaches and just a lot of people. No, we're absolutely thrilled to, to have you as our, as our guest. Um, I should also point out at this point that while we're all adults and we'll, we'll try our best, there may be an occasional swear. And yes, Hugh, I'm looking directly at you. <laughs> I'll keep my mouth uh, pinned shut and not ask too many controversial questions today. You guys are, uh, you guys, I know your reputations and I think, you know, it's true what you said about me in my bio, but me being an adult, that's a, that's a, that's a reach. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best anyway. Um, so anyway, here we are, season one, episode one of 80% Mental, and we're just going to jump right in with the, the first question, which is, what is sports psychology anyway? Now... I guess on the surface of it, it seems like a fairly straightforward question, but as is so often the case, straightforward questions don't always lead to straightforward answers. So, Hugh, uh, let's start with you, Hugh. When somebody asks you what you do as a sports psychologist, what do you, what do you tell them? Well, I often avoid the question and I avoid telling people I'm a sports psychologist because of this very question. Uh, so that probably tells you why, how difficult it is to answer. But I think it's something along the lines. I just avoid people in general. Forget about the question. You know what I mean? Like it's easier <laughs> if you just avoid people entirely, Hugh. That just cuts it off the question too. But yeah, just like let's just avoid people entirely. You will never have to deal with the question. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Nietzsche said, uh, "Hell is other people." But I think for for me, sports psychology is the the helping people think better uh, to enhance their performance and then also to help people think better in groups to enhance group performance and the two are very different things what are your views fader on that i think that you know what's interesting about sports psychology and psychology in general is it means so many things which is a benefit and a curse um, the, the benefit is that that you you can take the principles and practices in sports psychology to so many different areas and be so helpful. The, de the, the deficit or the challenge is that it's really hard to define what it is. Um, and so to be more specific, you know, there are sports psychologists 
like myself and you guys, who's a lot of our work is, is working directly with teams and with people on teams to optimize their performance. That is to understand that the mental part of performing is one of the strongest mediators or determiners of what how people perform or demonstrate their physical talent. So that's one of our, our jobs. But I think, you know, sports psychology also is about creating good science, asking good questions about how uh, people perform or what how people's behaviors optimized and to try to figure that out, too. I mean, I mean, one of the reasons I became a psychologist in the first place, honestly, is kind of selfish. Um, but I, I read this study as an undergrad, you know, when I was like 19. And it was talking about, I'd always been interested in psychology, but it was talking about how psychologists in general, forget about sports psychologists, but psychologists has, have a very high rate of satisfaction of their lives. And the theory behind that is because we do so many things. So I think it's a really, it's a challenge. I mean, we, we're going to definitely fill up this, this discussion with what it is. But for me, it, it really, it means so many different things to be a psychologist. But I think your point is, is true at the heart of it is saying, how do people improve? Um, and specifically, how do they improve with regard to performance, you know, on the court or on the field, you know, in athletic endeavors? Perhaps now's a good time to look at some some specific definitions because you mentioned, you know, defining psychology. Uh, every student will have come across Weinberg and Gould's text um, and they've defined sports psychology as the scientific study of people and their behaviors in sports contexts and the practical application of that knowledge. And they go on to say that sports psychologists identify principles and guidelines that professionals can use to help people participate in sport and benefit from sport. And they do this by examining feelings, thoughts, behaviors within sport, which is a pretty dynamic environment. You know, Feder, you spent 11 years working in pro sports. Does that capture what you did or is there a lot more to it than that? I mean, I think there's a lot more to it to that and that, you know, I mean, well, first of all, what I like about that definition is the word benefit, because I think so much in sports psychology, um, unfortunately, gets focused on on performance, on mastery. Right. And that there's not a lot of emphasis. There should be more emphasis on benefits, uh, meaning you know, how can sport impact and improve an individual athlete's life, but also how can sport in general impact and, and improve society? In my, in my belief, you know, sport is a form of improving society. It's a way to help people of all different backgrounds come together. It's a way of people getting out impulses such as aggression that are better suited for a game with rules and a game without rules. And so the idea about about benefit um, is something that I think should be more front and center. But I think, Pete, you know, to your question, I think that there's more to it in the sense that, you know, often I, I joke with people that I'm actually not a sports psychologist. I'm an anthropologist. And I think the part that isn't included in that definition is that there's a huge um, cultural and spiritual piece to this. And by this, I don't mean ethnicity. I mean, like when you join a team as a sports psychologist, you're actually kind of joining a new culture. Um, and I think that that's a part of this that's that's kind of missed in that. It's not just about sport and teaching techniques. It's about understanding humans and connecting to humans on a deep level. So I think on the surface, sports psychology is, yeah, it's definitely about uh, a set of, of guidelines, of techniques, of teaching people things like imagery, uh, self-talk, mindfulness. But on a, on a fundamental level, it's learning how to connect to a group of people like, you know, who works with weightlifters. If I'm a, I'm a seasoned sports psychologist, you throw me into the room with those guys, I'm going to suck. Right. Because, well, I wouldn't suck that bad. I wouldn't suck that bad. Um, but, <laughs> but, I, but I would be much worse at it than Hugh because I don't know the vibe. I don't know the language. I don't understand what the sport is at its, at its essence. Right. I, I, be, I think I'd be OK at it because I really prize listening and connection in my work as a sports psychologist. But what I'm trying to say here is that I think that definition leaves off the huge um, level of how much in this work, it's kind of, you know, a big part about being great at developing relationships. You know, that's interesting. You mentioned about anthropology because I've heard it said that instead of being uh, homo sapiens, we should actually be called homo narrans, as in homo narratives, because of the stories we tell ourselves and how we learn through stories. 
And I suppose I'm, I'm interested, like you've had 11 years experience at, at the top end of professional sport. What stories have you got from the start of your career to the end of your career and how sports psychology changed? Well, first of all, I just love that. I mean, literally, I love that. Say it again. Homo what? Homo narens. I mean, I love that so much because I think at the at the foundational level, even before sport, we're trying to figure out who we are as humans. We don't know. We're relatively new and we don't understand how we work. Right. And so I really love that idea. You know, I think, you know, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapien, you know, the you know, the being that knows that it knows. That's pretty inaccurate. Like I think it's the being that tells ourselves stories is a really great way. I mean, I love that. I'm stealing that Hugh. Sorry, man, but I'm going to start my own <laughs> podcast tomorrow and call it that. Um, but, you know, like, you know, the 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 story, uh, there's a couple stories that come to mind about about this. But I think fundamentally what you're getting at is, a, is, is what we miss a lot is that we don't understand our true nature. So actually, I'll tell you a story about this before I get to, you know, the stories about how my experience with sports psychologist is I've had the excellent opportunity to take sports psychology into the world of firefighting. And so, you know, Pete and, and you and I have been talking a lot about transferable skills, this idea that sports psychology can be applicable to everyday life and to other dimensions outside of sport. Because fundamentally what we're doing is we're helping humans understand how they can get better at whatever it is they do. In this case, sports, but we use it with other things. But I have a, a friend who's a, a, a combat veteran and a, and a rescue firefighter, an elite firefighter in New York City. New York City is one of the largest firefighting forces. It's about 11,000 people. And he and I have gone around the United States and, and now around the world training firefighters about how to use sport psychology or performance psychology techniques. One of the things that he does is he, he basically, um, to, to open uh, some of these lectures, is he'll show an example of a, a fire truck and he'll say, what's the most important tool on this truck? Right, and everybody's guessing, oh, the hose, the ladder, the Halligan tool, which is a tool you use to open doors, you know, these firefighters, veteran firefighters. And at the end, someone smarts up and says, no, the most important tool is the human, is the firefighter. And so what we go on to talk about is that, to your point, there's no manual for the human. There's a manual for every other tool, but there's really no manual. And so I think what we're trying to do as sports psychologists is create a manual, right, on what it means to be a human. Right. There's manuals on base running. I'm sure there's manuals on on deadlifting that, you know, all the weightlifters read. There's manuals on on on, uh, you know, cricket form and th this and that. But there's there's not really we are the people who are writing these manuals as sports psychologists on on the human. How does the human function in there? And so I think a lot of what we're our focus is, is kind of writing the manual, the informal manual for how humans work, especially under stress or especially in situations um, in which they have to reach deep inside themselves to pull out their, their best form. I love that. I love that idea of writing a, a manual for human performance. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, how that translates into the world of, of sport. You know, what are the things that you as a sports psychologist might typically do on a day-to-day -day basis working with high-performance athletes and, and, and coaches? Well, to be very clear, we have written manuals, um, you know, for teams. And what the the content of those manuals is is really breaking it down it, for the lowest common denominator, right? Meaning the person that has no experience with this. And I would say at at the center, one of the things that our field needs to do is be much more clear uh, about w what are the skills. And so I think at the foundation of those manuals that we write are are things about how to respond. Um, Actually, one way to think about it is Hugh's point, how to respond to the stories, right? Um, and so I think mm -hmm. the, the techniques that I think have been most helpful are self-regulatory techniques, meaning when I am aware that I'm under mental stress, which we're all under, whether we admit it or not. In other words, when my heart rate is too high or not high enough, that I have certain skills that I can go to to regulate. And so some of the things that we teach people in those manuals are breathing techniques for down regulation, meaning to be able to breathe in a certain way to slow my heart rate or breathing techniques for up regulation to get myself kind of more amped up and activated when I need to be. The other things that we teach people are 
messaging, to become more aware that we're constantly messaging ourselves, and to have responses to those techniques, to, uh, to those messages. One of those responses um, is about self-messaging and self-talk, and the other one of those is acceptance. So learning different ways, pathways that are more adaptive for when we're doing that. Every, every athlete, or every person says to, the, to themselves the most famous kind of performance, um, performance blocking word, shit, or the other one, right? Which I'll, I'll, I'll just keep it at shit for now because I don't know <laughs> that I can curse, but I, I, didn't, I don't want to start dropping F-bombs in minute 15 or wherever we're at in this thing. So we all, we all say... In our in and you know what shit means really if you break it down. I have a, a colleague Matt Krug for the who works for the Brewers, the baseball team in Milwaukee, who says you know basically athletes you know usually say f me, f it, or f you. Like that's the self talk that we we have, right? It's like f me, f you, or f it. And so there's certain responses that people need to lead to learn to those different kinds of messages. And the F me one is the most prevalent one, I think. It's the one that we all use and it has different forms. It has, I suck, it has, you know, um, why did I do that is another one of those or like, why, why didn't I do what I wanted to do? And to, you know, have, as we say, a response to those rather than a reaction. In other words, a planned idea about how I'm gonna do that rather than just a learned behavior that just formed. Um, which is really the F me kind of response. And I guess one thing that, that really interests me is that you're a clinical psychologist as well, right? That's true. So you kind of talked a lot about the performance skills just then. Can you explain a little bit about what being a, a clinical psych means in that sport environment? You know, when working with athletes and coaches, tell me a bit about that element of your of your work. Look, I mean, you know, P, like, you know, what's hilarious about this is I think that like most people – and, you know, don't know the difference yet between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Forget, forget, <laughs> like, forget understanding the difference between a clinical psychologist and a sports psychologist. But I'll break it down in very clear terms because I think it's important. Right. I think it's really important to understand. You know, many people work in the realm of sport and performance psychology. Um, and that there are those that are trained in pure sport and performance psychology. And that there are those also who have training in a clinical background as well. And if you have a training in a clinical background, meaning it's that you have extensive training in, in being able to deal with when people's problems go beyond, way beyond performance, and, and that they actually have some mental health challenge that could be severe anxiety or depression. Um, and that, you know, my belief is that basically it's all intertwined. I, I kind of have the, what I talk about is the continuum between I feel shitty, really terrible, I feel okay or I feel great. And I think most of the work in sports performance psychology is I feel okay and I'm working on getting better, but there's some people that feel really terrible. And so that, that element of feeling really terrible is usually that they have, you know, so if it's terrible and it's long standing, it usually means they have something clinical going on. I need more extensive help. I'm curious, you're training from a sports psychology point of view and a clinical point of view that's completely different to how people are trained in the UK where it's just purely sports psychology or within Ireland where it's purely sports psychology. And I'm aware across the world to our worldwide listeners that their training routes in sports psychology may differ. Do you feel as if there's, maybe this is a load of questions, there's a need for sports psychologists to be separate or combined with clinical sports psychology? Does it have pros and cons? How do we separate sports psychology from clinical psychology uh, in practice, I suppose? It's a really complicated question. I mean, I'm, I, I like talking about this, but because I think it's not talked about enough, but the way I think about it is like this. I think some of the most talented people that I've met in terms of helping people, even with problems that are border on what we call clinical, have been people that are sports psychologists. Um, and I think that many sports psychologists receive training and counseling. I think that basically it involves, though, you know, being able to understand what your training is and be able to just function within your training. So, you know, in it, it differs country by country. And I think it just depends on do you have training for what you're trying to help the person with? Right. So if you have training to help people with depression, you should do it. And if you have training to help people with you know deep anxiety, you should do it. 
Um, and, and I think what really is most important is that all people who work with athletes get some form of training on basic listening skills, right? To be able to listen at a deep level to people so that they can be able to determine what's happening. And I actually think coaches should get training on this, right? Because the reality is that most athletes aren't going to talk to anyone about deep problems except for people that they trust. It doesn't matter if you're a clinical psychologist or a sports psychologist. And so I think most coaches um, should get training in, you know, a technique that we've talked about, motivational interviewing, for example, is one. But that most athlete, most most people should get trained, especially coaches. Coaches are psychologists, whether they like it or not, right? They they get dragged into it. I think a lot of coaches avoid it because they don't know how to how to do it. But I think many coaches are actually most coaches I met are really good at it once they dive in, and once they learn basic skills for listening about you know particular problems that people have. So interestingly, Hugh and I were talking about um, the kind of evidence for sports psychology and, you know, does it actually work or not? And um, came across a study, a 2017 study by Daniel Brown and David Fletcher is a meta-analysis, which is just a, a study that looks at the results of a large number of, of studies altogether. And one of the conclusions from that particular study was that interventions are marginally more successful well, the effects seem greater when interventions are delivered by coaches rather than by kind of sports psychology practitioners. What does that mean for the role of the sports psychologists working with athletes and coaches? Well, I mean, you know, look, I mean, as I always say, I'd be happy to put out a business, be, put me out of business if we create meaningful change. You know, there was there was a study that said that that, for example, people get people who are who are depressed get better with exercise. Um, equally well to, to for example, um, you know, counseling. And so I think that if coaches are going to be better at, at implementing um, sports psychology techniques, they should. And I actually believe that. You know, I actually, one of the, I, I got into sports psychology because I went to the University of Washington to get my doctorate. And there was a professor there. His name was, his name is Ron Smith. And he was one of the earliest kind of like cowboys working with the Houston Astros. Um, and actually, I just I saw this, you know, you know, he's sort of going in there with his jeans and boots and, you know, working with uh, these, you know, these athletes that never could have been exposed in the 70s <laughs> and 80s. Right. He's on the frontier. man. I mean, amazing. He made it out of there alive. And he was one of the people who was early working in the United States with baseball teams. And I, I saw him doing this. and I was like, that's really that's really cool. I didn't even know that was a thing. This is when I was studying clinical psychology. And, and so I started getting exposed to it in my 20s and, and really. And one of the things that, that he did was he, Pete, he had that model. His model was to go into a team and train the coaches so that the coaches would train the athletes. And I think that's definitely the way to do it, um, especially in a system like, you know, an organized pro sports system or any system where you have a ton of athletes. Because it's unrealistic, you know, to, to say we're going to just have one, two or three mental skills coaches and that we're going to deploy and, and, and get out, disseminate all these techniques. Most of the techniques we teach in sports psychology are learnable by any coach. And with a little bit of practice and reading and training, most coaches can deploy some of these basic techniques that we're talking about, in my belief. So uh, I just want to clarify, by cowboy, you meant actual hat <laughs> and, and like because just the transatlantic divide here, for, in my head, a cowboy is somebody who's like a charlatan, who's like making it up as they go along. But you mean he was an actual cowboy with psychological skills? <laughs> you know, I, I got to tell you, I'm sorry to inform you and Pete this, but we're all making it up as we go along. The whole world. <laughs> you know, I mean, that that's the funny part about this, man. I mean, you know, I know you're joking. Well, first of all, cowboy, Ron, if you're listening to this, you're definitely a cowboy, but in the sense that, I think that, I mean, it is sort of like a renegade, right? It's like the first person to show up and, and do something in a different way, um, you know, to, mm -hmm. to ride out there on your horse and be doing, you know, in a territory where you don't know what's going on. And I think, you know, there's, you know, it's funny because I really believe that, that we are kind of frontier people as sports psychologists. 
right? We're on we're on a frontier. And, you know, this has only been going on for, you know, whatever. In, in the best case scenario, you could say this is going on for, I don't know, 80 years. But really, in the way it's going on now, it's been only going on for 30 years or something like that in professional sports. Um, and probably only at the extent that it's going on now for maybe 15 or 20 years. We're like, I don't know if we can say this in the UK, but definitely in the US, in the MLB, in the NHL, you know, in the NBA, in the NFL, this stuff has only been going on for 20 years in, and probably 10. So we are all kind of making it up as we go along. We know what we're talking about, but we're, we're adapting. And what I mean by we're making it up as we go along is as humans, everybody is questioning themselves. Everybody is asking themselves, you know, am I good enough? What do other people think about me? This is, you know, like you were saying, the stories that we tell ourselves. You know, one of the reasons that sports psychology exists is because we're all, to some extent, in moments of insecurity and wondering about how we're doing. And that thinking detracts from our ability to just be and demonstrate our talents. You know, it, it strikes me like you talk about the idea of the cowboy going into the frontier, and I think at elite sport, in as a as a psychologist, uh, you do kind of feel like out there on your own, trying to apply what you've learned and bring it into some sort of reality that works. And it's not really evident yet how work is done at a system level, at a team level, at, at an individual level. You know, the psychological skills training and, and that type of approach. But like, how do you work with uh, a team of coaches or a, t- a support a support team that's the backroom team? What's your experience there, and and how is that sports psychology, and why is that important? It's a great question, Hugh. And I mean, I think really at the center of your question is how is it different to work with groups than it is individuals, and in this case, coaches. And I think you know, Hugh, I think it's so important because. Um, you know, a quote that we, there's a, a, a Theodore Roosevelt quote that we sometimes quote that um, in terms of working with people in general, which is that people have to know that you care before they care what you know. And in my mind, you know, working with coaches, coaches have to understand that, that I, as a sports psychologist, get their point of view and their experience. I think a lot of times what we do is we go in the room and we say, Here's sports psychology. Here's how it can help you. But we don't actually form a a deep relationship with the group that we're talking. This is true of players, too, by the way. But so, you know, at the root of it, what I try to do with coaches is and and anyone is I think about it as kind of 80 percent connecting to the who the people are and 20 percent sharing knowledge. So this goes back to the anthropology thing. If you show up on an island with a tribe you're not part of, the last thing you do is say, hey, look, I, I have this new way to, to plant crops. Let's do it this way. Or, you know, wait, you know what we should do? Let's rebuild this house because uh, you guys are building it wrong. That's an instant way to get yourself killed. When you're working with a team, with anybody, you should spend a lot of your time understanding the values and who they are as people and only a little bit of time teaching or sharing things. And so I think that's that's an error I've made in my experiences too and i work really really hard on that so i think that's really interesting because you know we hear or there's a lot more attention being given to the mental side of sports performance but there's still a little bit of hesitation a little bit of maybe mystery surrounding it so if you are if you're a young sports psychologist and you're trying to get yourself out there and you come across an athlete or a coach who's just a little bit unsure. You know, they, they know how to motivate their athletes. They know how to do this and so on and so forth. If you don't have that time to spend, you know, building those relationships and building that trust, how do you, how do you sell it? You know, what's your, what's your elevator pitch? How do you sell it in 30 seconds? Well, this is what sports psychology is, and this is how it can be a benefit to you as a coach or as, a, as an athlete. It's a great question. So the first is a really great question. So I think this is a way to build on the the question that, you know, he was asking before, Pete, is that the first thing I would do, and I will tell anybody who's listening here, is you should ask the person. This is what I say to people. My belief is that you're the expert on on you and your players, right? You know more about your players and the sport than I do. But I'm and I'm, I'm just curious, what have you what experiences have you had with sport and performance psychology before you sell it? I really recommend asking that question. And then restating to the person 
summarizing what you've heard them say. Because if I pitch something to anyone, mm -hmm. I want to understand what I'm pitching to, right? I want to understand where their head's at before I choose what element that I'm going to pitch. So I'll give you a few different pitches that I might pitch. One of the things I say is, look, sports psychology is about helping people to focus on the right thing at the right time every time. We all know, we all know that athletes have show up with different versions of themselves every day. And mental skills training or mental conditioning is helping to give them tools to be able to show up with the version of themselves that they're trying to show up. In our view, in my view, you know, our, our bodies are like a corporation. The marketing department's our legs, the, you know, the, our arms may be the, the CFO and the financial department, but the, our brain is the CEO, right? Our brain is what allows us to control the rest of these different departments. And so our ability to work that and exercise that determines who's going to show up at each game. So there are people who would wonder whether or not sports psychology actually works. So if you're following a physical training program, for example, it's a lot easier to see results. You go to the gym, you follow a nutrition program, you get stronger, you run faster, you jump higher. I guess the question that a lot of people would have is, how do I know that mental training can get results as well? How do I know that I'm going to improve? See, for me, I don't, I, my, my idea is I don't like to pitch to someone like that. What I'll say to them is, right, what you're, what you're really struggling with is that this is an unclear area. It's an area where there's a lot of confusion and it's unclear how to get better. What, what have you tried so far to help people when they are struggling? And really what you get to at the bottom of line of this is that there really isn't a clear path. So what I what I want a coach to say to me before I say well, before I talk about studies or different techniques is well actually the reality is that this is kind of the only thing out there right so it's there's lots of data to say sport and performance psychology works right there's lots of data on, on the techniques we've talked about on mindfulness there's lots of but I found that for coaches it's more to, to realize that if they realize for themselves this is the only option, which it really is. If you're not going to do this, then what are you going to do, right? If you're not doing this to A, help athletes who are struggling, but B, help athletes perform better, then what else are we going to do, right? What is the other option? I think really coaches end up with that understanding of like, well, this is kind of the only thing that we have access to. Um, I think the other thing to do is to help coaches, and now it's, it's kind of easier but now help coaches to realize, um, to talk about athletes that are using it, right? So when you have like, it, in the, it's, it was much harder um, when I started out maybe, you know, 15 or more years ago, because I had to really rely on, on, on building relationships with people. That was the only way. It didn't matter, like pitches didn't work in my experience. What really worked was having people trust me as a person. Um, and then when I showed them things, then they would try them and those things would work then they would buy it so my experience is that coaches have to try them and have a, a positive experience with them themselves before they're able to it's almost that no pitch really works it's really developing a relationship having people try the technique and seeing that it that it works that that's a really good point i mean i think that the idea that you know you pitch your services and that we're trying to pitch uh, a service of sports ecology, which is ultimately some form of an intimate experience where you discuss people's feelings, actions, and thoughts uh, and how, help them pick them apart. You know, there needs to be a degree of vulnerability there. So I really like the idea that, you know, you don't pitch, you build a relationship and then you create an opportunity and a safe environment for them to play and explore with these techniques. And that's how you, you gain access. Uh, I'm curious, though, like, what do you do when you come across somebody who's like, say if you were brought in to work with a team, but you find out that the head coach doesn't believe in sports psychology, uh, but you've been told you need to go in and work with the players and the coach. How do you deal with that kind of head-on clash of uh, opinions? So you're saying, Hugh, when you're you're asked to, ask for the, by, to work with a team and the head coach doesn't buy in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that used to be the way that it was all the time. 
<laughs> I mean, that used to be the way it was. I mean, I think like when I started out 15 years ago, I mean, I have a, I have a, there's a, a, a colleague uh, I have who's been at this for a long time. And, you know, he used to describe that, that he used to, when he would go into the stadium, the team would ask him to pretend <laughs> that he was the hot dog bench. Right. Because there's so much stigma around this, right. That you had to like disguise yourself. Right. And I, and I've definitely worked with many, I mean, I've worked with uh, professional and even college teams where, you know, there, this aspect has been hidden, right? I mean, I've been at work with other teams where it was really front and center, and I've been in the media guides and all that stuff, um, you know, with the Giants and the Mets. But, you know, there's other situations where it's been very sidelined because people have the wrong idea about it. I, look, we're, we're 201, though. When I've actually worked with a coach that was resistant to this, it's usually because they've had some bad experience on some level. And so my goal is to connect enough that I can elicit that bad experience. And by eliciting that, in other words, I need to build enough relationship, enough a bridge with that coach that they can tell me, look, this is the reason I don't believe in it. Almost always, once that conversation is had, there's room for progress. There's room for progress because really this is a people profession and once there's trust in the person then you can go a long way right and so i think it's really about also you know the other way i think about this is is knowing when to swim right if any if you guys have ever been in the ocean right you go up to the ocean and you see the waves coming at you now if you just jump in at any random time and start swimming against the waves you're going to get destroyed <laughs> right and i have been destroyed there's one time in particular in, in El Salvador when I went surfing and I, you know, didn't know the break. And I went out there in this, you know, weird place and I <laughs> literally got served. These conversations with these coaches, it, it's really about finding the opportune time, right? Finding the, the timing to have these conversations. I think we, we assume, oh, that person hates me or that person doesn't like this. Th no, it's just a person. You catch them at the right time and you listen. And then you find opportunities to elicit their story about why sports psychology doesn't work. I believe a lot of it in listening and not telling. And if you listen to understand and, and find out from that person like what their block is, it's usually a very personal experience, either from another coach or something else that happened, or it's a fact that in some way the mental game was a barrier for them in their athletic career. Um, and so once you elicit that, that trust usually has that person say, okay, so tell me, what is it that you do? And then, then that's a better place to quote unquote pitch as, as Pete was talking. That's a better place to explain how you see it rather than trying to explain through the wall of waves that are crashing on your face. I really like that. I like that metaphor of waiting for the breaks. Um, we often get taught as, as kind of neophyte sports psychologists to just spend time in the environment, you know, just hang out be the person who collects in the cones uh, and helps set up drills. Just kind of be there and, and, and bide your time and really wait for the opportune moments to see where you can perhaps offer something. Um, I'm very aware of time. Um, I think we had one more one more question for you. The last question that me and Pete have is, is and maybe you've partly answered this, but like, what is sports ecology has obviously changed for you as you know when you were back reading that paper when you were 19 uh, it said sports psychologists are very happy people and, and most satisfied and have the most meaning i'm curious how has the answer to what is sports psychology changed since that you read that paper to now and has there been any big shifts when you've gone and completely changed your view on the answer to that question or did you always have the answer you had today and I think that people are um, – can I make like a weird I, – I just – I have like this uh, social justice analogy here. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. Yeah. To answer your question, I mean, the way that I think about this is just like what's happening in our country and our world right now, racism and white privilege has always been there. It's just that like people are awakening to it and people are realizing, oh, right, this is there and admitting it. I saw this – this, you know, video, this was, um, you know, anti-racism advocate that said, OK, she's talking to a largely white audience. And she said, OK, please stand up if you would be willing 
to be treated like a black person is treated in our country. And so, of course, no one stands up. And she says, well, if you know this, why aren't you doing anything about it? Like, if you know this to be the case. So I think the same is true with sports psychology. Everybody's always known that at the center of performance is our mental strength and flexibility. We always know that. I mean, you can listen to, to, to a basketball game from the, from the 60s and hear people talking about things like mental toughness. It's always been there. It's just that people are becoming brave enough to recognize it. And there have been certain people that have come out. I mean, notably, actually, in the NBA, um, I think more than other places, that this acceptance of mindfulness and, and people using it, like, you know, seeing LeBron James meditate on a sideline is like a big endorsement of some of this. So I think what's changed more is that it's becoming more accepted. People are, are awakening to the reality that what mediates or what determines performance is their mentality. It's not just about fixing problems, right? You don't have to be sick to get better. That idea is now prevalent in, in professional and amateur sports that everybody should be working on their mentality. The idea used to be that a sports psychologist was just there for head cases. This guy or this girl, this woman, she's you know struggling. She needs a sports psych. No, like the idea here that's changed is that this is really about mental conditioning. It's about being your best, and learning the techniques that can help you to bring out your best and that everyone needs that. Every athlete, every person. All that's left for me is to give a huge thanks to Dr. Jonathan Fader for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. It's a pleasure, man. I mean, it's just, you know, talking to you guys, it's great for me because I think that we don't address some of these questions about what sports psychology is. We just do sports psychology. So it's great to take a beat. And also, I think we're serving a lot of people because I get a ton of questions all the time about this. And I think this podcast is going to really reach a lot of people who are interested in the field and a lot of coaches that are trying to dip their feet into the waters of sports psychology. So it's a service you guys are providing, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. No, thank you. Well, I think just to add on top of that, uh, Fader, I think you're a little bit too humble. I'm not going to let you get off the podcast without plugging your book, which I thoroughly enjoyed, Life is Sport. And I think what I've taken away from this talk from you is the idea of like the skills that sports psychologists practice are transferable to everyday life, whether you're a coach or whether you're an athlete. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, to our listeners that uh, you get a copy of Jonathan's book. Hey, thanks, man. I, I really believe that. Look, I mean, we, even as, as coaches, you spend a lot of time in the field, but Inevitably, over our lifetime, we spend more time on the field of our lives. So these techniques can really help us not only perform better there, but be at our best and enjoy our, our lives more, both on the field and off the field. So thanks once again to Dr. Jonathan Fader as we come to the end of our very first episode of 80% Mental. We started off the episode by asking the question, what is sports psychology anyway? And through some fantastic discussion between Dr. Fader, Hugh and myself, I think we've answered that question. We talked about some of the key psychological skills that athletes and coaches might benefit from having. And we talked about some of the skills that sports psychologists need to develop as well. The idea that effective listening is key and that building relationships and trust is perhaps more important than kind of going in all guns blazing with what we've got to offer and what we can do. I really like the idea of writing a manual for human performance under pressure and part of the sports psychologist's job, I guess, is to help athletes and coaches navigate their way through that manual. I hope you enjoyed the show today, and if you liked what you heard, please do check out our website, www.80percentmental.com. 80% mental is all words, and please do subscribe wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. Check out our other episodes, and I hope to see you next time. Well, I won't see you next time because it's a podcast, but you, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm.